everybody, thanks for coming. I would like to thank Team Fresh from hdfractals.com for making that video and for giving me the permission to show it. That was a zoom into a fractal called the Mandelbrot set, and there are a lot of interesting things about that kind of visualization. Um, one is that even though that movie was only a few minutes long, mostly for lack of computational resources, we could have gone on forever. We could have made a video that keeps diving further and further and further into whatever that was. And no matter how far we would go, we would always see more and more detail, all of it which is a little bit fresh and a little bit new. And not only could you go as deep as you want in that direction, you could have chosen any point in that original image and dove into that point instead and seen something different that was yet still just as rich in detail. There are an infinitude of points that you could have chosen and you can dive infinitely far into every one of them. And it's important to realize that even though there's a lot of self-similarity, there's no copying, right? Everything there is subtly different from everything everywhere else. Now, if we as game designers were to design something with this same high concept. I want to make a game where you can dive forever and ever into something. How would we do that? You know, we might think of some kind of Photoshop content cheat where we make a bunch of images and as you dive we blend from one image to another to another and do some rotation and scaling to try and construct things, but it would always be a little bit faked by building content, we can't ever quite achieve infinite detail as we saw there. To give you some idea of scale, we'll talk about the observable universe, right? The entirety of the universe that we know how to see. Nobody knows quite how big that is, but estimates are somewhere between 20 billion and 40 billion light years across. So if you imagine that we had started that video looking at the entirety of the observable universe, then by the time we're about halfway through the video, we've zoomed so far that we're looking at basically the size of one hydrogen atom filling the entire screen. And that was only the first half, right? Because we kept going for another equal, equally long period. So if you imagine somehow there's an unimaginably large universe where each hydrogen atom in that universe is itself an unimaginably large universe, that is the scale of what we just saw. And that's quite a trick. And what's also quite a trick is to summarize it succinctly, and here's how you do that. Um, this equation tells you everything that was in that movie. Uh, here, Z and C are complex numbers, but even though they're called complex numbers, it's actually a pretty simple equation where you take Z, you square it, you add some number C, and then you make that the new value of Z, and then you can repeat this process. So looking at this equation, it's almost inevitable to ask, where did all this indescribable complexity come from? It didn't come from this equation. It wasn't put into the video by the author of the video, right? The, there are no slots in this equation for what we in the game industry call content. And so instead of seeing content, what we're seeing is something about the structure of the universe. It's maybe one small corner of the universe having to do with the behavior of certain classes of very specific things. But that's what we're seeing. You know, um, I was a youngster going on a teenager in the 1980s when fractals were first popularized and you would look in magazines and you would see images of these things and I thought they were pretty cool. And I played around uh, with them, with some home computer programs back then. But I, I feel like the past couple of decades of playing a lot of games and of learning from playing games and learning from the art of designing games, I feel like I have a deeper appreciation for this now that I never had before. And that's sort of what I'm here to talk about today. It's very difficult to discuss. When I look at something like that and like some of the other things I'll be showing today, I feel like I'm looking at something that may be beyond human understanding, and not beyond understanding because it's complicated and there's lots of things to figure out and keep track of, but because it's so simple, it's so basic, 
it is so much like fundamental things that we just don't have very much experience with that it's hard for us to grasp, close to the basic nature of the universe we live in. So that equation, z prime equals z squared plus c, did not alone generate that image. There was a loop structure around it, right? So here we have a 4x and a 4y, which is about iterating uh, across every pixel on the screen in x and y. And then we have another loop, uh, which is to repeat our equ equation in arbitrary number of times. And what we do when we repeat this equation is we keep computing new values of z, and over time, we watch what happens to z. Does it go towards 0? If so, we'll put the color black in that pixel. Does it spiral out toward infinity? If so, we'll put a different color in that pixel based on how quickly it went. And so on the one hand, we have this relatively inscrutable equation about which it's very difficult to look at that and understand very much on the face of it. And yet this loop structure that we have the ability to put around the equation turns this thing into some kind of microscope-like device that can show us pictures and make the phenomena described by this equation appreciable to the human senses. Let me talk about something else. Uh, this is LIFE, a cellular automaton uh, invented by John Conway in 1970. And the way it works is we have a field of square cells. It's infinite in all directions. It's two-dimensional. And each cell can be either alive or dead. So in this picture, the uh, white cells are alive and everything else is dead. There are simple rules that control, given that now is the current time, we do a step, and at that next time, some cells will change state. They'll go from dead to alive or alive to dead. And the rules are very simple, and yet the results can be sublime and surprising. And we can see a quite tremendous mixture of order and chaos. Uh, this here is one of the earlier constructs that was discovered in Conway's life. This is called the Gosper glider gun, named after Bill Gosper, the mathematician who found it. This is a stable structure. This will keep on going forever, and that piece up at there at the top is an oscillator of sorts. And every time those two guys come in and bounce off each other, they generate a little guy called a glider who's going to move off into infinity toward the lower right of the grid. Here are a few other things that you might see in life. Up here in the upper left is a loaf. It is a stable structure. It'll never move unless you disturb it externally, perhaps by crashing into it with a glider, which is the thing in the top center here. In the top right, that is called a pulsar. It, it's like a, almost like a set of animation frames. It cycles through this set of frames, but it's stable. It'll just keep repeating forever and ever. And this bottom one is very interesting. This is a thing called an acorn. On, one hand, you would think it would be a lot simpler than something like a pulsar because there's only seven cells right there. They're close to each other. You know, really, uh, what could happen? And I'll show you what could happen if I can handle Windows Alt tabbing with multiple screens. Right. Um, so here's a little life simulator in JavaScript, and that's an acorn up there. The squares are kind of small, but if you squint, you can see it. And I'm going to hit play on this. Boom. And a great deal of activity happens. And this activity keeps happening for over 5,000 time steps or generations in the life simulation. Right now, we're at about 1,000, so it's not even close to done. Now, this visualization is a little different from the earlier ones, because here, when a cell used to be alive and then dies out, we've colored it green. And as for all the life rules care, the green cells are indistinguishable from the white cells. But I like this because it makes for an interesting visualization that tells us something about the history of the space. All right, it's only about halfway through, but it keeps going so you get the idea. And now I'm going to remake that pattern if I can manage to do that looking behind myself. Oh, I can't tell yet. No. So that's our same basic glider pattern that we had before. And if I hit run again, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to explode into this bunch of chaos. But I feel like doing an experiment, I'm going to make a little change. So right here in the, in the acorn, did I say glider? It was an acorn. 
Um, we have this little row of three cells down here. I'm just going to add one more. Because maybe that'll make it bigger. Maybe that'll make it cooler. And let's hit run and see what happens. Boom. Not very much. Within a few generations, it uh, coalesces into this couple of stable states. Well, I'm going to stop and do that again. And I'm going to add an extra cell again, but I'll do it in a slightly different place. Let's say up here, at the same height as that previous cell. Let's just see what happens. And now it explodes out into something not as chaotic as the previous thing, or not, not as stable as the previous thing, not as chaotic as the original acorn, but this interesting symmetric kind of a shape. So let's look at the code that makes all that happen. Just like with the Mandelbrot set, we've got a two-dimensional loop iterating over all the coordinates. Now each coordinate represents the cells in the grid rather than a pixel in a bitmap, although it's pretty much the same thing. And what we do at each of those uh, cells is we count the number of neighbors that are alive. And based on that, we do something different. If we count two neighbors, then we don't change the cell. If it was alive, it stays alive. If it was dead, it stays dead. But if we count three neighbors, we make the cell alive. So if it was dead, you can imagine that that cell was nourished by its neighbors, and, and now it's going to be alive until something else happens to it. And if anything else happens, if we count any other number of neighbors, then the cell dies. You can imagine if it had less than two neighbors, then it starved. And if it had more than three, it suffocated. Now, these rules are very simple. But as you've already seen a very small taste of, they can harbor great complexity within them. And people are still discovering this complexity. If you go on the web and you search for different cool stuff in Conway's life, some of the things were discovered within the past five years. There is a discipline called system theory that goes to great lengths to define what a system is. But because we're game designers in here, I'm going to use a hand-wavy game designer definition and say that a system is a set of rules that causing behavior uh, to occur over time. And what I like about systems, or what I find fascinating about systems, is that systems give you something back that you did not put into them. Right? When we looked at those rules of life a second ago, nothing in those said, hey, make a glider anytime these two big structures bounce off each other and make that glider travel to the lower right corner of the grid. It's just somehow what happened given certain initial conditions. And in general, that's an interesting attribute of systems. There's more to a system than you can understand just by reading its rules. And to really understand the system, you have to engage in it, right? You have to visualize it and play with it sometimes possibly for a very long time. Another way that I like to think about this is to say that systems answer questions. And the starting state of the system is a question. In that film at the beginning of the talk uh, of that fractal, the question was pretty simple. It's like, what is the behavior of these numbers in a certain very small region of space? In Conway's life, the question is more complicated. It involves asking what happens when we set up these conditions such that certain cells are alive and other ones aren't. And then the system crunches on this question and outputs the answer. And in general, we have a visualization that makes the answer appreciable to humans. When you look at an equation like this, it is hard to glean much, even mathematicians don't see the full consequences of this equation just by looking. But when we provide a visualization of the consequences, and suddenly everyone can see it, everyone can recognize it as beautiful. And furthermore, this visualization can lead us to ask questions that we wouldn't be able to ask without it, right? It can serve as an avenue to further inquiry, further investigation, and lead us in directions that we would not have gone otherwise. Now, in the field of games, We've had examples of complexity arising from simple systems of rules for over 4,000 years, right? This game in the picture here is Go. Go has very simple rules, yet it's considered by many to be the deepest and most beautiful game. 
And I think that it's deep and beautiful, not arbitrarily, but because there's a tremendous wealth of stuff that comes out in the gameplay that wasn't put in by the rules, because again, the rules are extremely simple. And you can't understand Go by reading the rules. You have to play the game, and in fact, you have to play it quite a lot. That's a board game, and most of us are here to talk about video games, so let's do that now. Here on the screen, I've drawn a very high-level picture of what a video game looks like. We typically have a loop, just like with those iterative systems discussed earlier. And the loop is around some functionality. And for a game, we typically read input from the player. We do some simulation based on that player input and the current world state. And we do some rendering, which provides the visualization. And what is inside this simulate function is some set of rules governing how the world state evolves, which is directly analogous to the sets of rules that we looked at for Conway's life or for the Mandelbrot set. Now, the difference between games and those earlier things is, of course, that those earlier things were non-interactive, right? In games, we provide interactivity by reading from the input and using that to somehow change the state that Simulate looks at. And so from that standpoint, that systems answer questions, the interesting thing about games is that we're changing the question all the time. We're modifying it on the fly based on what the player does. So if I just ask the question, what, what is answering the questions? Well, the knee-jerk answer to that is, well, the simulate function is answering the questions. That's where the computation takes place. But suppose I'm not satisfied with that, and I ask again, well, what about the simulate function is computing the answers? And, you know, again, at first blush, the answer to that is, well, there's just a whole lot of, there's millions of lines of code in there, maybe. And it all does a bunch of different things, and we somehow piece together this big structure that makes the game do what we want, and that's how the questions are answered. Um, but I will claim right now, and I will come back to this claim a little bit later, that if you manage to look closely enough at this simulate function, you will always inevitably find some point, actually many points, where the implementation actually happens in the universe and not from the programmer. And what the programmers manage to do is encapsulate a bunch of these little things that the universe does and put them together in all these tiny things until he builds up a bigger structure. Like I said, we'll come back to that. But the reason that I'm talking to you guys about this now and thinking about things in this way is that I've been the unwitting beneficiary of this kind of generosity of the universe. Um, this game, Braid, that I released a few years ago, was a really fascinating development experience because it was very clearly the case that more ideas came out of the development process and ended up in the final game than I put into it as a designer. Right? The process of designing the gameplay for this game was more like discovering things that already exist than it was like creating something new and arbitrary. And another way to say that is that there's an extent to which this game designed itself. So this is a game where you travel from world to world, and in each world there's different rules about how time behaves. And I did have an authorial hand in building this stuff. It involved picking what the worlds were, what they looked like, perhaps, um, and the nuances of the rules of how time behaves. But my role here was about choosing what questions to ask, right? So the first question that sort of started the game was, well, what happens when you give the player the unlimited ability to reverse time? And then you can just ask that question and type in some code that is sort of a um, programmer way of asking the question and look at what the code does. You know, maybe you have some ideas before you run it about what it does, and those might be right and those might be wrong, but if it's an interesting enough idea, then when you run the code, you're going to see some surprises, right? You did not foresee everything that was possible 
as an answer to this question. And then, of course, we can refuse to be satisfied at that point. We can be excited by it and say, wow, this stuff is cool. But yet, let's ask another question. Let's say, what if all that's true, but then we could make some objects immune to the player's ability to reverse time? How does that change the situation? And we can observe that. And that can be exciting, too. And then we look at the next thing. Well, what, what happens if that control over time isn't bound to a control as, as such, but it was bound to your position in space? And so we can come to the game with question after question after question and type in some code and get answer after answer after answer. And if we're tapping into the right thing, then the volume of answers available to us can actually be quite large. But what's important is that those answers were not authored by me. They were generated by a system corresponding to the questions that I asked. Now, because there are so many answers, one of the things I did as author was to curate the results and clean them up so that they can be best appreciated by the audience for the game. Now, this is a puzzle game. And the way that I got the puzzles would be to take these interesting phenomena that I observed and build a puzzle as an illustration, right, as a communication of that phenomenon. And through the years-long design process of this game, as I saw the rules unfold, into compelling puzzles, I felt like I was tasting a little bit of truth. And an important part of the reason why it tasted like that is because that truth was something I was observing. It wasn't something I was making up or concocting. I don't know how to concoct truth, but sometimes I get the feeling when I observe something that it is true. At the start of the design process, I had this idea that I wanted the levels to be pretty simple. And I had a lot of game designerly reasons for thinking that. Um, you know, I wanted it to be relatively easy to navigate through the levels. I wanted it to be clear what's foreground versus background and all kinds of concerns like that. But as I designed levels and pursued this design methodology, I found that I always wanted to make the levels simpler and simpler. Because the simpler that I made them, the more beautiful they were. And I didn't understand why that was for quite a while, except that, you know, when you add complications to a level, you're obscuring the puzzles, and when you remove complications, you're letting the puzzle be there, and it's somehow more pure. But I think in the context of this speech, I have a further explanation for it. And that is that when things are simple, when you're down to the fewest interactive elements, and you've minimized the complexity of the level geometry and whatever else you can think of to do in that regard, that simplicity provides more room for truth in the design because it leaves less room for author contrivance. You as the author are taking a lighter hand to construction. There is always going to be contrivance in a video game, and there certainly was in this one, but I think we want it to be just the right amount, enough to ask a question but not so much that the answer is presupposed or unduly constrained. Because remember that systems answer questions. And if you take a little bit too heavy of a hand design-wise, if you start answering the questions yourself a priori, then you aren't letting the system express itself. And it may end up a little bit dead, a little bit muted. So that was then. Now I'm working on this game called The Witness, and it's a first-person 3D puzzle game. And when I first had the idea for this game, I was very excited about it. I had a high concept. It was really compelling, and I knew I really want to make this game more than any of these other games on my list. There are two parts to the high concept, and the first part involves uh, these touch panel interfaces, like you might see on a tablet computer that are common these days. But they're mounted places in the world, and you walk up to them and you solve them by drawing a line from one place on the panel to the other place. Now, I knew early on that I needed a lot of ideas for these panel puzzles. Because this was going to be the lead-in to the rest of the game, or to this other half of the game, and you know, once something is big enough to serve its functionality as a lead-in like that, if it 
once it reaches a certain size, it's no longer ancillary. It's no longer the tutorial, right? It's the game. And if this is part of the game, there has to be enough there that that part of the game justifies itself, right? It has to be rich enough in meaning, rich enough in player discovery and the other things that this game is about, that it doesn't feel added on or like, you know, something that shouldn't really be there. So I knew I had to, I thought I knew that I had to create a lot of really interesting ideas to put in these panels. And I had some ideas originally, but upon pursuing them, I realized that they just weren't that good and they weren't leading to anything very productive, certainly not the quality that I envisioned for this game. And so I wasn't sure what to do about this and I started to despair. But fortunately, this was a really big project just because it's 3D and all that. Uh, so, you know, I had to spend some time building the engine, I had to spend some time putting the team together and all that kind of thing. And so some months passed, and at the end of that period, I came back to the design problem of these panels again, but I came to it with a fresh eye, remembering more clearly my experience with Braid, and I said, well, um, I'm going to come to this with an open mind and have the intention to see it freshly and to really just listen to what's going on here and, and not try to dictate too much about what the ideas are going to be. And uh, very quickly it happened, without me really even having to think about it, that I entered into a new investigation process with these puzzles. And a huge variety of ideas became apparent that I hadn't seen before. The ideas had always been there, but before I hadn't been able to see them, and now I could see them. And there wasn't much of a difference between the two times except for my approach. And these ideas that I saw now, they comprised a system that was deeper and much more interesting than the system comprised by my original set of ideas that I had hypothesized. And I think one of the reasons it was more interesting is because it was simpler and contained less contrivance. And that was really, it was really great to experience. And so one question to ask myself is, well, how did I get these ideas? You know, how, how did I see them? How can I reproduce this in the future? And that's actually a really hard question that I don't exactly know the answer to. But it had something to do, in this case, at, with looking at the core activity of the game, the simple scenario of tracing a path through a grid or a maze, and just asking what can happen in those situations, right? What can happen to a path, generally? What could happen to a maze, generally? Um, even forgetting how I want this stuff to come together later in the game, just what happens if I just put these in a bag and shake it up? If I let them interact in the same universe of discourse and see what comes out of that? And so some of the things that came out of that didn't go into the game, but a lot of them did, and in fact, so many of them did, that now that my original situation is reversed, there's so much good material in these panel puzzles that I have to edit it very heavily and keep the number of puzzles down. And my big worry now is that the other half of the game, the part that I used to think was the awesome part, uh, now has to somehow bulk up and get more in it to justify its placement alongside this part of the game. So it's completely reversed, but that's a wonderful situation to be in because then you end up with a much better game than you ever thought you would have had. So once in a while I give a lecture that has some kind of idealistic uh, framework such as this, or that's not completely connected to the day-to-day -day realities of you know, typing in lines of C++ code. And somebody will say to me, that's all well and good, but you know, if you're making some weird game, right? But I'm like making a regular game, uh, and, and how do I apply this kind of technique? But I don't really think it's that hard. And the way I think I would go about it, you know, let's presuppose that I'm working on a relatively unimaginative game. I've got some guys, and the guys have rocket launchers, and they run around a world, and they shoot each other with the rocket launchers, and once in a while, one of them gets hit and explodes into wet chunks or something, right? And even there, if I imp build that game and implement that game, I claim that already at some level, that game is based on the same stuff as the fractals in that video at the beginning and on Conway's life. 
In fact, that has to be true. There is no way around it. And the reason is the same thing that I was talking about before. If you look at the implementation details of that simulate function and you dig deeper and deeper, eventually you will always strike something that is a property of our universe and not an idea that the programmer had, except in so much as he had the idea to take that aspect and incorporate it into his program. Now, it would be very boring to slough through pages and pages of code, so I'm going to switch to designer goggles again and say that as a designer, if we want to see this, we can change our focus from high concepts down to details until we see things like, well, in this game, guys chasing each other with rocket launchers. It's a pretty interesting thing to observe that assuming the guys are all moving at constant speed, and I'm here in the world looking around, a guy farther away from me is going to parallax much more slowly than a guy really close to me, right? And if I'm trying to hit the guy close, I have to turn really fast. And if I try to hit the guy very far, I turn slowly. And that's an interesting way that gameplay is affected, right? And that's not a new observation. I think that everybody who makes first-person shooters is aware of that. However, focusing on that perhaps is a little different than the way that people usually do it. Another thing we might observe is some kind of miracle of discontinuity, you know, where I shoot my rocket that way and it explodes after hitting a corner of a wall, but if I had aimed it just a tiny, tiny hair to the right, it would have missed the wall completely and sailed off much further into the world. And those are pretty interesting, and if you just start brainstorming around those ideas, you might have new ideas that, that want to lead you somewhere, but it's always a good idea to refuse to be satisfied with that first level of answers, and to say, okay, that's cool, but let's dig deeper, right? And if we choose to dig deeper into this, we might see some things like uh, more fundamental properties of the universe. I've got a rocket sailing through the air toward a guy, and there's something there that's about the fundamental way that a body with a faster speed overtakes a body with a slower speed in space, right? That's, that's just something interesting to play with. Right? Or when I'm looking around trying to figure out who to shoot at, if I just zen out for a second, I can really see the way that the linear structure of space determines what I can see and what I can't see. Right? Like the way that things become occluded and unoccluded and occluded again as they move through a space from my perspective. And so what happens if after making this kind of observation we strip away the fiction, guys or rockets or whatever, and take those low-level ideas like parallaxing and occlusion or discontinuities or whatever, and then build the game back up, starting from those fundamentals and the observations we make based on those fundamentals and taking them from one idea to the next to the next. What do we get? Now, we may even build it back into a game that once again has guys with rocket launchers blowing each other up, but at that point, it would no longer be a game about guys with rocket launchers blowing each other up, right? Those would be an implementation detail, and the game would be about something else. And that's pretty interesting. So what I'm getting at here is a design philosophy, and it's not one that I have often seen. You know, you come to a conference like this, and, or, or you, know, you read websites on how to develop games, and it's pretty easy to see things like, here are my seven steps on how you design a game, or here's a structure that all games conform to, and if you can fit your game into this structure, then that will tell you things about how you can make the design better. Um, what I'm talking about today really doesn't have any of that, and that's part of what makes it so difficult to talk about. Uh, but my best attempt is just to say that this design philosophy is about being open to what is here, right in front of us, seeing what the universe has made available through the very fact of existence. Because actually, it's quite a lot of stuff. There's certainly no shortage, but seeing that stuff can be difficult because we're not used to it. It's a design skill that we may have to build. And furthermore, we may have to go against what we've learned, because it seems to me that contemporary game design is often about the opposite of this. It's about dictating rather than listening to things and observing things, right? 
before Braid, my idea of what it meant to be a game designer was that the game designer's job is to have some really cool idea, and then the team, or maybe that designer if he's independent, goes off and types some code and builds some assets, and you try to make this construct, program plus data, that somehow implements that idea and makes it happen. And inevitably, that's very difficult. So you just start, you get a big sledgehammer and you start hitting the code really hard and try to bend it into the right shape. That's what I used to think, but Braid and The Witness have taught me differently than that. And I think that when you approach things in that old way, when you design according to some preconceived high concept and you're dictating that things conform to that result, that's a process of presupposing the answers to those questions, right? We're not letting the system itself answer the questions and we're not, we're not therefore letting the system do its job or express itself to its full potential. And what's beautiful about systems is their expression. So why do we want to spend so much effort muting that expression? Now, when approaching design this way for the first time, it's sort of a natural reaction to have a little bit of fear or at least strong uncertainty, right? If I'm not making something, if my role as a designer is not to come up with really something smart or something super brilliant, then who, who am I and am I necessary in the world, right? What's my point? But there's really not much reason to worry about that because you can just switch around the way that you're thinking about this it's no longer creating something from nothing, but instead you can visualize it as sailing a ship going on a voyage of discovery. And that ship needs a captain, and there's a big difference between a good captain and a bad captain. And even disregarding good and bad, there's a great difference between a captain with one style and a captain with another style. So we haven't gotten rid of authorship here. We've just changed the idea about what authorship is. It's no longer about creating things from scratch. It's more about being an astute observer and being someone with an eye for what is interesting. Going back to that video at the very beginning, the idea to investigate the behavior of fractals and the decision to draw and color them, the ways that were chosen there, are authorship kinds of decisions, even though the actual content of the image in some sense the things generated by the fractal cannot be authored, right? They are part of the universe. They are just there. The, so the role of the author in this case is about building that bridge between the things that are just there and our human minds and senses that want to perceive certain kinds of things. And so I think as game designers, this is really a power that we have that people in other media don't necessarily have, or at least it's not their home turf, right? We can build systems, we can listen to those systems and hear fundamental truths about how they operate and what they want. And then we can visualize these truths to make them appreciable to the human senses. And I'm not trying to claim that this is the only way to design games, obviously it is not. But I do want to suggest that you can become a very effective designer this way. And furthermore, I want to suggest that as a design community, we can get pretty far by thinking of ourselves as people who build microscopes or telescope-like devices for observing the world we live in rather than just being people who make things fun or who tell stories, even though we can do that stuff too. And the reason all this works is that we don't really have to work hard to do any of this, right? The universe itself has an unlimited supply of generosity and surprise built in and as designers, we only need to keep our eyes open to what is here. Thank you. I'll do questions now. Anyone? Oh, hey, slides. We've got a mic in the center aisle if anyone wants it. Is someone raising his hand back there? Hello, um, I 
just like to ask, um, how do you think about um, randomizing things in games, randomizing quests, randomizing uh, levels, randomizing uh, whole worlds, all the universe? Um, what do you think about it? Most, most people say it's, it's ge generic, it's uh, boring, it's always the same, things like that. Yeah, randomization can be very interesting, right? In, in a number of different ways. One is just that it's, it's a nice way to create situations a player didn't expect, right? There's a long history of games that do that, going back to roguelikes and sort of up to modern roguelikes like Spelunky, which is a free game on the PC, does a really great job with randomization and creating situations that you didn't expect. And that's really fun. And there's another way that I like randomization. Um, Frank Lance at the GDC uh, in America this past year had a talk about how randomization actually can teach you about the universe. And he, uh, you know, he used poker as an example of a game that has a large random element, but also a skill element. And that was pretty interesting. Um, and there was another talk I saw, I think it might have been the year before, that really upset me. <laughs> uh, it was about Sid Meier talking about how they, uh, they goosed the randomization in several of the Civ games. I think he might have been talking about Civilization Revolution specifically. In order to more strictly match what players expected, to make the game feel more fair, right? This is not level randomization anymore. It's more about what's the outcome of this battle given s troop levels of such and such. And I'm really not a big fan of that because I feel like it's the opposite. It's almost like um, infantilization, which is a bit strong of a word for that, but, but pandering to the player by trying to make the player think that randomness is something different than it actually is. So it depends on how you use it, I would say whether I'm a fan or not. Yeah. Hello, hi. So uh, thank you for your talk. My question would be, you, you spoke a bit about uh, being a designer that creates systems by uh, asking questions and I suppose sometimes being surprised by the answers. Yeah. Uh, my question would be, how do you make sure that the players do the same things? Because I suppose sometimes uh, the players might ask different questions and get different answers. And while I guess you can have some precautions taken for that by doing play testing and stuff like that, um, how do you manage to, ma to keep your, your auteur or curator status, as you put it, while at the same time not being surprised by what players do, the set of questions and the set of expected answers you, uh, you put in place? Wow, I feel like that's a very broad question because the answer could be different for every game. You know, I mean, it's funny, the games that I make, so far at least, do seem to be about uh, requiring the player to ask questions of themselves like that, like what's going to happen if I do this. In fact, it seems to be, um, seems to be kind of what the games are about at some level. Uh, for my games, but I don't think that that's true in general. I think that you could make a game that... I certainly you could make a game that's completely linear where the player doesn't have very much choice and yet that also has this kind of thought behind it in design. So I think it's orthogonal what the designer does compared to what the player does. All right, thanks very much. <laughs>